again, you're being an activist. I am it's not. That's not appropriate, sir. If you, who, who are you with? What's your name? That's not an appropriate question for you to ask. I do, I'm you're going to ask how many questions? You get three? What a stupid son of a bitch. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Friendly Fire. In this episode, I bring on Josh Havaka, and he will let me know right away if I have pronounced his name correctly this time, unlike the last time that I had him on. And he is running for chair of the Libertarian Party here in Florida, the whole state party. So we will bring him on and we will talk to him and find out if he's really ready for the job. So let's bring him on. Josh, how's it going? Good deal. How are you doing this afternoon? Did I get it right this time? Close, almost. Better than last time. It's a halavka. <laughs> okay. So, so when you run for the LNC, uh huh. maybe Somebody's, I'll get it right. Someone's going to jack up my name there too. It's okay. Right. I think what happened last time, because I was talking to somebody a while back, I think what happened last time is I kept reversing the L and the V, and I kept wanting to say like Havlaka or something like that. And so what I really should be doing is just like staring at the word and like, remember Sesame street where it was like, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> that's what I should do. Yeah. So anyway, um, so maybe I'll be doing that here uh, in the future, just so I can start getting people's names correctly. Uh, but close is close. I guess we will have to accept it for now. So how are you today? Doing well. How about yourself? Yale? You know, I really can't complain too much. Um, you know, and that's a lot coming from a libertarian. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. but we're going to talk about you running for chair of the LPF, the Libertarian Party of Florida here. And we've had you on in the past. Um, I don't have any clips, folks, so you'll have to go dig them up yourself. But uh, we, we had Josh on uh, last year, I believe, when you were running for vice chair, uh, yes, vice chair for the Libertarian Party here in Florida. So let's get into it. We know who you are. You've you know, anybody that's a voting delegate likely knows who you are already. So, but you can give like a two minute intro just in case or two, three minute, you know, just a couple minute intro for anybody that may be, you know, that may be a new delegate that wasn't here last year and maybe hasn't really been paying too much attention. Gotcha. Thank you, DL. Well, for all of the uh, new Floridians who've moved down here in the last year or two. My name's Josh Halafka. I've been the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Florida for the last two years for you guys. Um, I've also was a former member of the LNC credentialing committee for the last term over there. So um, I've kind of had my fingers in a lot of pies. I'm also a member of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania up there where I'm still a dues paying member where I used to live up in Philadelphia. So um, done a lot of stuff i've been a member of the party for 10 years roughly since the 2012 uh, ron paul campaign where that kind of brought me onto the party and helped me kind of get led into that so that's a little bit about who i am a lot of people you guys are going to get to see me at convention i'm going to be there all weekend so don't hesitate to come up and make conversation if you do see me around the convention hall absolutely and he is not as scary as he might seem with that big beard so because i've met him in person <laughs> folks so we're, we're good to go. Don't don't be worried about coming up and having a conversation, sticking your hand out and introducing yourself and asking him maybe a few questions, if you will. Um, I think that's mm -hmm. always a good thing. So let's go. Let's dive right into it. Um, why? Why move on to the chair position rather than retain, uh, you know, uh, run for, uh, for another run again for the vice chair? What's well, motivating you to move forward? Well, that's what's motivating me right now, DL, is my opposition, which is non-existent. So okay. the kind of the situation is, is that the chair role is a mandatory kind of position that needs to be filled as part of the uh, structure of the LPF in order for it to continue to exist. There has not been anybody else who's decided they want to step up to the plate and uh, swing at the ball, so to speak. So I've decided that I'm going to take that lead and you know, try and go out there and hit a home run for us in this situation. Okay. And, uh, and have we, you know, and we don't want to focus too much on any opponents, but have we not heard of anybody that was even considering it or weighing it out? Like just nobody wants it. Is, is it uh, yeah. bad that nobody uh, wants know. to be the chair? You know, Dio, I honestly, personally, and this is just my, once again, personal opinion, but I just think we have a really bad negative stigma within the LP. And that's, I'm not even talking the LPF. I'm talking the entirety mm -hmm. of the party. 
where we look at leadership roles right. as a punishment and not a privilege. It's something that a lot of people should be aspiring, you know, and I think that has more to do with the individuals where a lot of people, I don't think, believe in themselves that they're ready to step up and fill that role or commit to those duties. When we have a very, a lot of very smart, dedicated activists and individuals in this party who could, you know, help lead it forward. So, you know, quite frankly, I just think it's a, it's a culture thing in the party. They just, people look at it as a punishment. You know, you always hear the joke when you win a, a party office is, con, you know, congratulations because, you know, hey, guess what? Now you get to do all this work and, right. you know, we're all volunteers. It's not like the two major parties where they get a big, you know, six figure salary to do these roles. You know, we're Whoa, doing this minute, for the lover. Uh-huh. You didn't know that, Dio? Uh, I wasn't aware, but uh, let me check out my um, supervisor of elections uh, website yeah. for just a moment. You go ahead and keep talking. <laughs> oh, yeah, Dio. That's I'm a joke, not, folks. I'm not making this up. No, I didn't. I was not aware I was going to say, oh, yeah, the, the, the GOP chair and the uh, the Democrat, I believe the uh, the Democratic Party of Florida chair gets about $250,000 a year. I think the GOP chair gets about $300,000 a year. Okay. You know, I get a pat on the back and hey, great job, Josh. So, right. I mean, once again, you know, libertarians, we're not in this for the money. We're in it for the love of the game, for the love of liberty. So, you know, that's kind of why, like, you know, why I'm stepping out there is, mm -hmm. hey, nobody else is, thinks they're competent and capable of doing this. You know, that's on them. I'll step up to the plate. I feel I'm confident enough to get the job done for us and take us that next step over the goal line. So if we have a culture where people aren't aspiring to be in leadership roles, do you think that is more to do with the philosophy where a lot of people tend in the libertarian community tend to eschew the idea of authority and kind of equate leadership with authority or and, and it could be something else, but I'm going to I'm going to split it into two potentials. Or is this a failure of leadership in general? to inspire people to come behind them, pick up the mantle and carry on. Dio, the definition of leadership is motivating people to do things that they no wouldn't normally do. Right. So keep talking real quick, I got to, I got to plug something in. I apologize. It is okay. Keep talking. I, I'm, no, I'm going to keep talking for you here. So, you know, this has become where our leadership has made this into something that has been viewed as being a miserable task. Our leadership come out at the end of their terms. They talk about how bad everything is, and they put an emphasis on negativity, which is a huge problem. I, you know, me personally, I'm a very positive person. I, I prefer to, you know, emphasize the positive things about anything that we're doing. And I'm very honest. I'll tell you, hey, if something if something isn't fun, I'll be honest. Hey, this isn't fun, or it's you know not the greatest thing to do. But at the end of the day, we need to stop creating this continuous cycle of negativity where, oh, be in the chair. Oh, it's so hard. It's so bad. It's the worst thing in the world. It's, you know, the most burdensome thing I have to do in my life. You mm -hmm. know, no, show people that, you know, you can enjoy it, that you don't have to be miserable, that it can be fun, that you enjoy the work. You know, if you can make it out to be something that's fun. That which we learn through pleasure, we never forget. So mm -hmm. if you think that you're going to enjoy what you're doing, you're going to want to do it. If you think it's going to be a miserable task, nobody wants to pull weeds. Why? Because it's hot, sweaty work. Right. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I, I do think that there's a little bit of both going on in the in the community that, um, you, you know, that we kind of need to get our heads screwed on straight, if you will. And that um, our leadership needs to inspire people. Uh, so that was the reason why I had I, I asked that question, because um, that's that's my particular thing. So are you prepared to come? How will actually not how are you? How are you prepared to come in and be different? And I think this is a very important question because a moment ago you. So so I'm going to kind of start with the, the feet on the fire here. Right. You said that you stepped up to the plate because uh -huh. nobody else did not because you were inspired to take on the role, but because nobody else was doing it. So are you prepared to come in and, and, and be the kind of leader that changes though, you know, the, the attitudes that are causing somebody to have to step in? Yeah. He, and the short answer is yes, Dio. I mean, mm -hmm. I've already started this as the vice chair where I, I, 
for lack of better words, you know, I, I don't like complainers. If you want to sit there and complain, that's fine. But I believe in problem solving versus complaining. Now, what's the difference versus you know, of com- problem solving versus complaining? Well, it comes down to problem solving. If you want to sit there and complain and complain and complain, and that's all you're going to do. You're going to be a complainer. Now, if you complain and complain and complain and complain and come up with ways to resolve the issues or the things you're complaining about, that's problem solving. I prefer to be a problem solver, not a complainer. I'm not going to talk about, oh, what's going on that's negative. And if I do, I'm like, okay, well, this isn't going our way. This is what we can do to fix it. I'll, I'll present options. Some of them may not always be the best options, but you know, hey, these are the options here. The, let's stick, keep ourselves based in reality. What can we realistically do in these situations? Some people get a little bit lost, I think, sometimes and, you know, start focusing on the trees so much that they forget that they're in the forest and you know, forget that, hey, we have to be realistic with our solutions. We can't just come up with these grandiose solutions that are going to, you know, put a big paintbrush and swash over the entire wall of liberty and the Libertarian Party. No, we need to focus on this is a specific problem and here's the specific solution. And not only that, but here's the pathway to get from this problem to the solution. Because a lot of times we don't actually explain what the pathway to that solution is exactly. Okay. So do you have an example of doing just that so far since you've been the vice chair? Um, I mean, you know, we have a lot of different um, public and private, you know, communication channels within the LP. And I see this a bunch where we have membership who want to, for lack of better words, complain about things. As membership is wont to do from time to time. And, you know, I don't begrudge anybody. Some of these complaints, they're relevant complaints, you know, and they're valid. You know, we're not always doing the best, but we do have room to be better. And, you know, if we have those opportunities, we should take them. But if you're going to sit there and, you know, bring me complaints, well, I want to hear what your solutions are. And I ask that directly a lot of times is what is your proposed solution? And when I get the feedback of, well, that's not my job, that's your job. Well, that tells me that you're not actually thinking about what the problem is that tells me you just want to complain. And that's where I just kind of, I, I start to shut down that conversation because that brings a lot of negativity in. Once again, Dio, we work with volunteers. These aren't right. people who are getting paid a big cushy salary here. These are people who are, you know, taking time away from their jobs, their families, their social lives to dedicate that time to the party, its activists, its candidates, and its issues coalitions. So I want to make sure that when people are going to bring issues to the table, that mm-hmm. they're also coming with solutions, DL. They, if you're going to come and complain, please be a problem solver with me. Don't be a complainer. Nobody likes a complainer. Okay. Um, so what what's on your mind for the the coming term? You know, let's go ahead and assume that you win the election, right? Uh-huh. And for anybody that's watching that may not know, it is not a guarantee, even if there is uh, only one particular person running, because there are always two options within the Libertarian Party. Somebody, people, the the delegates could always vote for Noda, and it has happened. Um, I believe, actually, even at the LNC level years ago, they, uh, I believe, the delegates. I think it was the chair rolled. The delegates did not like who was running for chair. They voted Noda, and then they had to take. Uh, floor nominations for an entirely new set of people. Um, and, that, and that set can be anywhere between one or more. And so the way that it would work is if if the delegates in Florida voted NOTA, then Josh would be uh, removed from the ballot. He would be ineligible for this uh, election. He would be eligible in, in, in a different election, but not this one. And then we would have to take floor nominations for somebody else. So it's not a guarantee. So do you, so now, you know, getting back to my question, um, do you have any, uh, like, like, what are your plans? Cause I'm assuming that even though you, even though you maybe didn't sit down and say, I would like to be chair and maybe it was more like, Hey, somebody needs to be chair. I think I can fulfill that role. I assume that you've sat down and then thought about, okay, what am I going to do as chair? What am I What am I bringing to the party in that role? And how am I going to make the LPF better than it was? Like, you know, so so what does that look like? Okay, Dio. So that comes down to, you know, what some people may 
kind of recognize as a three-pronged strategy. So what that comes down to first is first and foremost, candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe it was a, uh, a, a former LNC chair from a few years back who once said is that we can't be the McRib of politics. We need to be the Big Mac. And what he meant by that is we always need to be there. We can't just pop up surprisingly mm -hmm. here and there on a ballot here, a ballot there. We need to be everywhere always. You know, I, I kind of want to be that. I want to be the, the Big Mac of politics for us here in Florida. We have a lot of opportunity. We need to get candidates on the ballot. That's first and foremost, Theo. And I don't mean, uh, you know, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, DL. If there's an open race, I want an L, L candidate in there. If there's a one candidate unopposed race, congratulations. You just got an opposing opposition candidate in the form of a libertarian. That's the big focus, you know, kind of pulling back from the trees into the forest thing is we need candidates, man. We need candidates on the ballot. We need candidates running for office, particularly at the local level, because quite frankly, that's where we win, win as libertarians in the party is at the local level. Right. A lot of them are going to be nonpartisan. Let's be frank here. But that allows us to start to build kind of like a pro sports team a roster of talent that we can kind of filter up and we can treat that local polit political level. It's kind of almost like the minor leagues that, Hey, we're going to get you guys in there. You're going to build up on your fundamentals, going to build up on your skills. And then eventually, Hey, these really great local level candidates, guess what? We're going to filter you up to the state level. Now let you run for statewide office. Now we're going to get some wins there. Great. Now we can filter some of these winning statewide candidates. Up to the federal level, great. We got Senate seats. We got congressional seats. We have a governor race that we can win. In the meantime, put good messengers in there in those big races that are going to get the message out there, that are going to attract people, that are going to generate a little media. We saw it this year. You know, you had three guys in Duval County who did a lot of great things for us getting recognition and media attention. We had Hector Roos out here who ran for governor, our mm -hmm. second, or, second governor candidate in the entire history of the LPF. Very proud of that, that we got somebody who generated a lot of media attention and, you know, put a lot of eyeballs on us as a party here. So first and foremost, once again, candidates. So, you know, I could go on and on, but the bright focus, candidates, candidates, candidates. Okay. Number two, we need to have better party organizational structure. So that comes with just making sure that we put the right people in the right places to succeed here. I'm kind of have to you know, start to evaluate what kind of talent we have within the LPF and not just keep putting people on committees or in positions because, oh, they've been around a while. They're good people. They've done a lot of hard work and, you know, a lot of good work. That's excellent. I appreciate the work. But just because, you know, you're great at baking bread doesn't mean I should let you do brain surgery. I'm sorry. You right. know, you're, you might be the best bread baker in the world, but Brain surgery shouldn't be what you're doing. And quite frankly, I need to stop making you the head of my brain surgery department. Okay. Outside of that, it, it, it's just the last thing is fundraising. We need money. The, the party just always is going to need more money. It's never going to be something that's going to stop. That's going to continue to be an issue. Even mm -hmm. if we fundraise in the seven, the eight, the nine, the 10 figures, there's always room on the table to utilize more money to do more things. Now, right. there's a lot of ways we're going to look at trying to generate these funds and these fundraising opportunities. Some of them are going to come in the, you know, some of these are going to come in partnering with, uh, you know, um, like 401c groups that we're partnered with. And we have issues coalitions with looking for opportunities there. Some of these are going to be looking into packs that we can partner with, look into opportunities there. But the idea is, is that we need to bring in money to the party, bring in money to our candidates, and start to make it so that way spending a little bit of money isn't an issue. It's just something that we're we're doing like the other two parties. And just as a for instance, the GOP just during the 2020 election cycle alone, just in the primary races, raised over $20 million in the state of Florida. Wow. You know, if we could even touch one million, I imagine the things we could do as a, a state party out here. I'm just I can't even fathom it because it's just it, it's so overwhelming to think what we could invest in our candidates with a million dollars. Got it. So let's kind of walk through each one of those. I got a question for each one of those three items. So we'll start with the uh, the very beginning one. You said candidates, 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 which I don't disagree. I know that there's a lot of people in the party 
uh, well, there's a disagreement within the party in general, not just the Florida party, but in general about what the party's role is, like what it's and, and you know, what is its purpose. And I say the primary purpose is to run candidates and attempt to win elections. And the reason I say that is because we operate under a very strict guideline um, set forth by the government. So therefore, there are a lot of things that we simply cannot do um, that can be done by uh, an organization that's not a political entity. Um, so would you agree on, would you agree to that? Yes or no? You know, DL, I, I'm kind of, in, maybe honestly, like it, why not vote? We can do both. It's just, you know, you have to be smart about how you do both, you know, and I understand where you're coming from. There is a wing of the party that we are, uh, uh, our, our purpose is to run candidates and that's what we should be doing. The other half, you know, I hear, we, we need to be a messaging party. You know, even Nolan had said that we, our job was to, you know, be a, a harbinger for libertarianism into American culture. That's our, our, our purpose here as a party is to spread mm -hmm. libertarianism. Right. Why not both? We, we can. And, and how do we do that? Well, it, it comes back to candidates again. You run really good candidates who can deliver our message. You partner with good issues coalitions that those candidates can cling on to and have a platform to speak at and to garner extra, you know, media attention and word of mouth advertising from. And, and you have a solid party infrastructure that helps these candidates get in the media to get out there and have events that they can go to and speak at and to draw some attention themselves. And, you know, just as well, provide some volunteers for door knocking, petition signing, mm -hmm. you know, helping them fundraise and do phone banking and all that, you know, you, you've been on campaigns, you know, where you understand the, the level and depth that comes in with that. So right. you can do both at the end of the day, though. We, okay. We've had some really great candidates who've delivered some really great messaging around the whole state of Florida. So you don't have to sacrifice messaging the wrong candidates. You just have to make sure that the candidates you're putting out there message well. Right. And and I think that's where I'm kind of coming from. Like, if you have good candidates, then the message will follow. It's kind of inevitable. I don't. So therefore, I don't really need to worry about the messaging. That's why that's why I say it is because I'm like, you have a good candidate. Well, that's what they're going to do. They're going to deliver a good message. So I no longer need to put messaging as part of my function because that comes with a good candidate. Which brings me to, to my next question, and I guess I have two on this particular one. So, what when we talk about candidates, 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 um, wow. and you know, we just recently had Hector Roos. He ran for the governor of Florida, um, and he got heckled, heckled, heckled a lot online um, by some libertarians and by you know others who weren't weren't libertarian, and that's fine. That's that's what happens. Um, and he and, and I, I I did not know that he was actually the second one a libertarian to run for governor. I know that we had had Adrian Wiley back in I believe 2014, um, but I I guess I kind of assumed that somewhere along the line there was another one prior to that maybe, but I guess not. So how do we get good candidates? Because here's the thing, or or I guess we can start with a how do we get candidates and b how do we get good ones? It turned out by luck, by happenstance here in Jacksonville, where we just had three candidates run for city council. I think all three of them were great candidates. Uh, I, I paid very close attention to the things that they were saying. I went to, you know, some of the events, you know, as I could that they were going to, um, they would kind of give me updates and just in general and tell me like, kind of like what they were doing. And I was like, man, that's a really good idea. This is really, and, and I was, I was really, really impressed by their drive and their willingness to go out and really try to be a solid candidate. So we got lucky because we had no other infrastructure to build that. They just showed up basically at the door and said, we're ready to run. And they did. Since we can't necessarily guarantee that will happen, how do we make that happen? Okay, Dio. So I, I want to kind of pause real quick on because it was kind of a, a lot of questions all rolled into two. So Sorry. I, I want to start. No, no, no. I, I want to start by thanking you for bringing up the Hector Roos situation because that was actually something when you brought up, you know, messaging. I did want to touch on. Okay. Is Hector? You know, I because I do remember that Hector got a lot of heckling. Uh, I know there was some county affiliates who didn't take kindly to some of the messaging he was providing. 
-hmm. Now, when it comes to candidates, you know, this is where it kind of comes into your question of how do we find good candidates? Now, do I think Hector was a bad candidate because of some of the heckling he got? Absolutely not. Right. Far from it. Candidates need to have good teams around them, DL. Now, part of that sometimes is, especially at the level that Hector Roos was running at, you need to have, for lack of better words, people on your team who know how to spin things for you. When you say something, you need to, ha- you know, especially if some, because you're, you're liable, you're out in the public, you're making public comments constantly. Eventually, as a politician, you're going to stick your foot in your mouth. I'm sorry. It happens mm-hmm. to every single one of them. Doesn't Absolutely. matter what level of the game. Now, if you don't have a good spin doctor on your team who can sit there and go, okay, you already said it. It's out there in the, in the cosmos. Here's how we mitigate the damage that we're doing. Hector didn't have that. That was Hector's problem. Now, how do we, how do we prevent these situations from happening in the future? Well, kind of like you said, we really talk with our candidates. Hey, what are you running on? What are your platforms? What's your team look like? Now, for those ones at those lower levels, we don't really have to worry about the spend doctor, so to speak, at the upper level, state, federal level politics. Mm-hmm. You, you need those people on your team. If you don't have one, guess what? The party needs to be supplying you with those types of people. People who work in marketing, people who work in PR, people who work in communications, who understand the art of the spin. You want to know why Donald Trump was so successful? Because he could say anything and he had a team of spin doctors on standby who that wasn't what he said. Well, that was what he said, but that wasn't what he meant. Well, maybe that was what he meant, but you just didn't understand what he said. Well, you didn't, maybe you did understand what he said, but you know, that that's just not truthful at the end of the day on how, the character. of you, you just need somebody who's just going to keep making sure that they're protecting their assets. At the end of the that's day, true. our candidates are assets. We need to protect them. Now, how, where do we recruit them from? Well, everywhere. We got tons of people out there. There's tons of reasons that people want to run for office. You know, we just need to reach them where they're at. Hey, what has the government done that's been so egregious to you lately that's pissed you off enough that you, you know, that's made you angry? What is what has the government done to you lately that's bothered you a lot? Mm-hmm. It, has it been tickets? Has it been taxes? Has it been ordinances? Has it been regulations? What's in, what's agitated you with the government? Okay, we want you to run on that platform. You're, you, you're a big proponent for medical freedom. That's what we want you to run on. Hey, you're a big 2A person? Run on 2A. You're worried about the the public school system? Great, run for school board. We're looking for these people to recruit them. And then like, kind of like I said earlier, put the people in the best situations to succeed. So, you know, that's also, once again, comes back to party infrastructure. It comes back Mm -hmm. to the candidates committee, putting all the people in the candidates committee that can support these candidates, can recruit them, and then look for, hey, what are you running on? And then, hey, okay, medical freedom this is what you know here's some ideas based on our platform you can use for your platform at the end of the day we need to provide value for the candidates hey this is why you want to come to the state party and ask for this help get these people on your team you know know that we're here in these situations where hey maybe you put your foot in your mouth what do you what do i do now great we have people here who can help Right. So in, in, and I think that's going to be similar, um, if I'm correct, to I think her name is Christina Pushaw or something like that. Um, but it seems like I, I see this woman. She, she seems to run interference for Ron DeSantis uh, on Twitter. And I'll see this woman pop up in the, it seems like the most unlikely places. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of browsing Twitter and I see something people are, you know, doing their their thing, criticizing Ron DeSantis. And then like out of nowhere, I'll just see a comment from her. And, and it's along those same lines. She's like, well, you don't know what you're talking about or, you know, some sort of, you know, snarky comeback or something, you know, something to kind of combat the mm-hmm. criticism is what it seems like. And, and, and it seems like I find her sometimes on really small accounts commenting, uh, maybe not that much, but, uh, definitely on many big accounts as well. And she, you know, it seems to be, that's what she's up to is basically running interference. So you're saying somebody like that, um, for at least our maybe state level candidates. Um, I don't know how, I guess it would depend locally, 
um, on the local politics and the size and scope of that particular election, whether or not it would be necessary at that level. I think at Jacksonville, you know, if you if you started gaining momentum, you probably would need somebody like that. Um, other cities, maybe maybe not so much. So, okay. So since we're talking about the organization, I believe that was number two, which was, mm -hmm. you know, changing the organization and getting people where they were. And it's funny that you said, you know, just some, because somebody has been here a long time, doesn't mean that you necessarily belong in that position. Because I, I agree with this idea that we need to put the right people in the right roles. And that a lot of people, especially in nonprofit organizations where everything is volunteer, what tends to happen is you get people who are willing, but not necessarily that's their wheelhouse. And I remember seeing this years ago when I was in leadership in the church, I would see a very similar thing where, um, you know, it, the running joke was, you know, Sister Mary so-and-so wants to do this thing, but nobody ever attends. But, you know, it would hurt her feelings if we stopped doing it. So we continue doing it you know, to, to be nice rather than maybe reallocate our resources so that, um, you know, because the, the thing that I feel like the church and the libertarian party share in similarity is a limited, at least many churches, not all of them, some not, you know, obviously not the big, huge ones is a limited amount of resources to work with. So how does that, how, how do we get people where they need to be, especially when we run the risk of hurting people's feelings? Because People don't really like to be told they don't belong in a particular role because they may be passionate about it, right? It's like if I wanted to be a singer, and I assure you folks, you do not want that, right? But let's just say that I had a passion for singing and I was terrible at it. Um, you know, it could easily hurt my feelings for someone to say, DL, we think you do a lot of great things in the liberty movement. Singing isn't one of them. Can we get you to move from, you know, trying to produce music videos of yourself to this other thing? that we think you're more suited for. How do we have that conversation? How do we make that happen and not lose volunteers in the process? Well, good question, DL. And before we get into that, I'd just like to remind anybody viewing that we are going to have karaoke at the LPF convention. So everybody should come on down and see uh, DL's <laughs> rendition of Can You Feel the Love Tonight that we're going to have him doing. So if anybody's coming to the LPF convention, fundraiser we're getting dl cummings to sing can you feel the love tonight over here so when is that again because i'm gonna have uh, to check the calendar uh oh well that is going to be april 21st through the 23rd in kissimmee florida i believe we're going oh. to be at the wyndham hotel in uh no that i know i mean the karaoke <laughs> oh i believe that is going to be uh saturday night saturday okay uh-huh excuse me so now back to the actual question at hand of, you know, how do we get people in the right places without hurting their feelings? Well, it, it's kind of, you know, unfortunately you have to have hard conversations with people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been in management and supervisory roles for the last 10, 12 years now. So unfortunately, sometimes you need to have what we call in, in that managerial world, critical conversations with individuals that, hey, we're not getting the, the results we need from you at this position. And we don't necessarily dislike you or what you're doing, but we need to be realistic with what we're trying to do, what our end goals are, and what is actually realistically being brought to the table at that time. So, you know, for some of those people who just aren't cutting the mustard, that's just going to have to be some, you know, crucial conversations. Hey, you know, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to, you know, you don't make it personal. Mm -hmm. You just stick straight to black and white, hard facts and data, which is in a lot of times, hey, we're not seeing positive results. If we are, we're not seeing the results we're expecting. And we want the opportunity to, you know, have this chance to try out some other options here. You know, a lot of people are probably going to retain positions because a lot of people are already in good positions. You know, there's just a few roles that you know, I, I think we could do better at, and it comes back also, like I said, to organizational structure. Once again, I have a floor motion out on the table to reduce the amount of regional reps because the last three conventions I've been at, we've come in, I think 2021, we had three or four open regional rep positions vacant going into convention. Last year, I think we had two. This year, I think we have two or three right now. So, uh, you know, it, it's starting to seem like it's a pattern that maybe we're too big of an organization. Maybe the organizational structure is 
too big. We need to consider consolidating, shrinking down our numbers so that way we can be better at the things we do, allow people to be in positions where they're not trying to juggle three at once. You can focus on your committee and not have to be on the EC. And not for nothing either, something I'm going to be looking at going into the 24th convention is going to be consolidating our committees. We have 11 committees. There's a lot going on. I believe that some of them could be consolidated into each other and some of the some of the standing committees we have right now, they could be subcommittees for other standing committees. So, I, I mean, it, it's really just looking at what those opportunities are and do we really need this position or was this something created for some indefinite reason in the past and it's outlived its purpose at this point? Right. Okay. And then last thing, fundraising. Yeah. Um, that's always the big one. Um, what do we do to increase fundraising? Like what, what are some of the things that need to happen? Actually, let me back up. Do we, okay. um, we, we, you know, we, we like to talk about the idea of like, you know, you know, getting many donors, getting a uh -huh. big donor, a whale or what, what have you. Um, first and foremost, are the donors out there to capture or have we basically captured most of them? Like in your opinion, like is, is, is there something, you know, or would we be, I guess, are there donors out there that are not yet donating? Let's put it that way, that are available to be captured if only we had something that was giving them the, the, um, uh, the desire to part with their money with us. I mean, every organization in the history of it organizational it organizations the else they probably would say yes to that question if there's something there's always donors out there every person out there is a potential donor it's how do you convince them to part with their money okay and some of that's a little harder some of that's a little easier now i don't want to get into too much of the detail because this is something i'm still working out but you know kind of like i alluded to earlier maybe that's partnering with 501ccs maybe that's partnering with PACs. maybe that's looking into you know, hey, how did the two, once again, major parties solicit donations and fundraising? Right. right now, the biggest thing I've learned over the last two years is the, the concept of a whale donor. At, 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 you're, you're chasing a white whale that doesn't really exist, in my opinion. It's fiction. There, there's no whale donors out there. If there was a whale donor, they'd already be donating to us. The fact of the matter is, is that those whale donors that we talk about all the time, they're just, they're not realistic. You, you're, you're chasing somebody down who wants to be handed, you know, it's quid pro quo. What am I getting for you in return? Well, you're getting to spread the message of liberty. Well, that's not something tangible I can hold, I can use, I can benefit me. So, right. you know, that comes into, okay, well, yeah, we realistically, we've tapped out donors. You know, you know, you're asking them, hey, donate to the party because you believe in us. OK, well, what has the party done recently? Well, we've won a couple local elections and, you know, we're still the third biggest state party affiliate in the country. And, you know, that's really cool and all that. But that doesn't really give anybody a reason to donate money to the party. Like, OK, right. you, you want some oil, water and soil boards. You put up a couple billboards, some places couple of your candidates ran, you know, one of your candidates run for governor and lost. Cool, real cool, dude. You know, we need to start showing people that we can win. That's where it goes back to local elections. Cool. Hey, now look, we won 100 elections around the state. Oh, you won? 100 elections? Okay, okay, I can maybe part with $5 now. Come back the next year. Oh, they won 200 elections. Okay, I know I got $10 for you. Okay, now they're, they won a couple of state house seats this time. Interesting. All right. Now I got $50 for you. Oh, you ran for governor and you came in second place to the, the re incumbent candidate? $100 for you. You see how you got to give people a reason. This is a long term game deal. A lot of people, unfortunately, just I, I find it funny. A lot of our membership talks about being what we call low low time preference. That is, you know, you're foregoing instant gratification for the idea that what's going to come later because you're delaying that gratification is going to be better than getting gratification in the here and now. And what I've learned is a lot of our membership is actually high time preference, 
which is that they want that gratification in the here and now. They want to own the left. They want to dominate their political enemies. It, it's a really disgusting thing that's kind of a culture thing that's coming to the LP. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's recently because I've seen this over the 10 years. There's always been a wing of the party that we need to crush our enemies and have them driven before us. And, you know, that's great. I want to hear the lament of their women too, but that's not who I am at the end of the day. You bring people through joy and positivity. When you come in with a negativity and a, a sense of force and domination, that brings the worst out of people. I want to bring in people who are you know positive, who want the best in life, who care about people, community, you know, issues that are affecting them and their communities. So right. you know, it, it, it's really kind of a, a two-step process here. You, you give people a reason to invest in you because you're doing right. things that positively affect them. And you're also ignoring the things that negatively affect them because, hey, that's not bringing anything to the table here. I got to step away for just a second. Give me just a moment. I know. So I guess another thing I can talk about while Dio is out of the room right now is, and we can kind of make this a, one of those little bonus features, I guess, is I, I want to talk real quick about two things that we really need to focus on as a party, and, and that's the concept of power real quick. So, you know, I agree that, you know, power is something we need to learn as libertarians how to wield better, because just quite frankly, you shouldn't be scared of the concept of power. Power is something that is useful in all facets of life, personal, professional, it doesn't matter. You know, those who learn how to wield power effectively are very successful people. So if we want to be successful as a party, we need to learn how to accept that we have to wield power and how to do it appropriately. Now, trying to crush our enemies and own the left and all this other nonsense you see out here with the culture war BS, that is exactly what I say it is. It's BS. Focusing on these types of things is not where it's going to come from. Now, personally speaking, I think Spike Cohen has been the smartest out of all of us so far in harnessing the power of people. People have the power. People power. Wow, what a concept here. Everybody taking care of themselves, focusing on each other. And hey, once I have my four walls secured, we're going to help our community out because I, I know my four walls are taken care of, so I have enough to pour back into my community. Really great concept. Other one, power positivity. We need to focus more on being positive. So definitely something we need to start focusing more on as a party it is that concept of not only people are the power, but that if we stop being so darn negative all the time and everything is woe is me and we're the victim, we can actually come out and win. We need to stop talking about, oh, well, they're keeping us off the debate stage. Okay, well, let's find our own ways to bring our own media attention to our candidates. Oh, well, they're not letting us have an opportunity to be on this ballot. Okay, well, stop chasing our tails with ballot access and start trying to figure out how we can guarantee it instead of trying to go for more petitions. There's a tons of ways we can 
you know, look at it from a positive perspective instead of a negative one. All right, Neil, you're back. So I can. I stop am. Giving I everybody apologize, the bonus folks. Um, it sounds like no, you uh, just kind of went ahead and kept going. So no, I had enough. a little fun. You're going to have a fun little bonus clip at the end. You can uh, edit in there later, I'm sure. Okay. Well, so if I, I'll just go ahead and leave it in. I was going to edit it out, um, uh, folks. So if you don't know, uh, I am Liberty Dad, which means I have a child. And sometimes things happen and, you know, it's just unavoidable. And I've got to go and take care of something. And that's exactly what happened. No big deal. That's the name of the game, folks. Okay, so now we're back. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea what he just said, so I can't ask him about any of that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and presume that it was all good. But something that you were kind of walking into right before I had to step away, um, okay. it really got me thinking. I was like, you know what? I actually have another uh, one, I think, my final question for you. So we've had an issue um, and man, I'm having all kinds of issues. I had a light that just go out cause I didn't plug it in. We'll, we'll be fine with that. Like you can have this dark side. This is going to be like the most disrupted episode ever that I've ever put out. But at any rate, so we've had issues in the past where, or and we still have them where there's a divide in the party. Right. And uh, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but, and right now it does not appear to be affecting Florida too terribly much. Okay, and the divide that I'm talking about is back in uh, 20 back in 2022, the party changed hands effectively. The Mises caucus, they went through over the course of a couple of years and they won a lot of seats in a lot of state parties. And then that allowed them to effectively um, they kind of did exactly what the party should be doing. They won a bunch of small seats and eventually won bigger ones and bigger ones. And eventually they were able to take over the national party. And that's created a lot of hostility between people. Now, it hasn't really that I've seen affected Florida, at least not in the way that I've seen it in other states, because you've got other states where there is there are lawsuits going on. There's all kind of, you know, state parties have split away or tried to split away. So my question to you is, um, as chair, how would you ensure that the state here from Florida is able to function and do all of those things? Because when that hostility rises up, all of those things are not going to be able to be accomplished because people are going to be too busy fighting each other to be able to come together and build an, an environment where you have uh, candidates that want to run, where you have people going to the right positions to really support the party and to deliver results to uh, donors, big or small, so that they will want to part with their money. Those things just can't happen if we're all busy infighting. So how do you how do you how, how do you ensure that we don't succumb to that or at least keep it at a minimum? All right, Dale, and that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because it, it really kind of brings everything I, I, I've been doing here since I've gotten actively involved with the party kind of full circle. So, you know, I want to start by kind of giving everybody a background. So I came in to be active with the Libertarian Party of Florida based on kind of like Dale said, that Mises caucus takeover kind of strategy there. Now, mm -hmm. the strategy was was that kind of like Dio said, the Mises caucus membership would win at the, the state and county levels. They would win board positions, win delegate seats to go to state convention, go to state convention, win seats on the state board to have a majority. And then that allowed us to have enough delegates to go to convention and hold at least the majority to elect a slate of candidates for the LNC that essentially represented better our views and, you know, the direction we wanted to take the party based on right. our strategy we were trying to enact. Now, the word that you should have heard the most in there is the word strategy. This was all based on a strategy. Everything was a strategy. Right. When, when at the local level, then when at the state level, then when at the national level, we had a strategy, D.O. That's the same kind of thing that I want to bring to the parties. I, I you know, it's something I'm working on. I, I have a few details I need to work out and some verbiage I need to smooth over. But I do plan on coming in with a strategic strategy, you know, a, a strategic plan for the LPS, what we can look to do. And kind of it kind of touches on a little bit of everything we've touched on here so far, DL. Messaging, 
how candidates can be part of that messaging, how they are the messaging messengers, what we can do, you know, that we can have bold messaging without having nonsense and troll posting and all of that here, you know, so it's kind of crafting a, a strategy that people can get behind, you know, a lot of the reason that people didn't get behind the Mises takeover strategy was because they weren't sold on what they were hearing. Takeover strategy, what do you mean? We already have good libertarians running the party. Why would you need to take over the party unless you're some right. kind of non-libertarian? Right. I've heard it all before, Dio. Uh, you know, uh, you know, being very forthright, you know, a lot of that takeover strategy for the LNC that was conducted by the Mises caucus, I'm going to let everybody in on a deep, dark secret that if people were paying attention, they would have realized is that Hi, I had a very, very, very heavy hand in creating that Mises caucus takeover strategy for the LNC. I'm very big on strategic planning, DL. If you come in with a plan and you know how to execute it and you are able to stick to the plan that you're looking to execute, you can be successful. The reason the Mises caucus was successful is because they created a plan, had a strategy, they executed the plan, they stuck to the plan when they faced adversity, and then they won, which is the same thing I want to bring the floor to here. Is, hey, I'm going to bring a plan to the table. I'm going to make sure that everybody understands the plan and knows how to execute it. We're going to execute the plan and stick with it through the adversity because it's going to come. We're going to hit potholes and speed bumps in the road because the road was built by the government and the government doesn't do anything quality. Sorry, guys. And, <laughs> and, and we're going to win. And you know what? That last part there of we're going to win, that's going to bring the donors. That's going to recruit the candidates. That's going to help convince delegates that, hey, the, the things that we're doing to improve, in my opinion, the, the infrastructure of the party are, are being successful. And, and it's going to give people a reason to want to continue to pour into the party and to invest. I, I, I want to give people a reason to invest because this is what it is. This is an investment. We're a volunteer organization, DL. When's, what was the last paycheck you got from the LP? How much was it for? Uh, I have not received one yet. I wasn't aware that I was supposed to yet. Oh, really? You know, that's funny because I haven't gotten a paycheck either. You know, so it sounds like, DL, that kind of like me, you're doing it for the love of the game because you enjoy going out there and you enjoy meeting people where they're at. You enjoy supporting candidates. You care about the people in your community and you care that much that you're willing to, you know, sacrifice a little bit of your, sometimes your time, sometimes your money, sometimes it's your, you know, your blood, sweat, and tears to go out there and try to improve your community through spreading the message of libertarianism and helping getting our libertarian candidates elected. And that's what I want to have everybody find that value to invest that little bit of time. And then once they've invested that little bit of time, I want them to find value to invest even more of that, that time, that money, that effort. Because that's what's going to help us be successful, Dio. It, it, there's nothing I'm doing that's special. There's nothing I, you know, and nothing, no offense, but there's nothing that you're doing that's special. We're all doing things that anybody else in the world can do. We're just choosing to put that time, sometimes the money, and a lot of times it's just a lot of effort into it to do these roles, to fulfill these obligations, to commit to these duties that some other people are going, well, hey, I'll do, but only if I need to do it. Oh, I can help with that. But, you know, you're going to have to ask me nicely first. I, I don't want to have to. I, I want people to come out and through the just pure volunteerism. Hey, man, I, this is such a great idea that I don't need you to come out and ask me. I don't need you to even force me to do it. I want to be here because I love this so much. And, Theo, you know, that's why I want to kind of get at here is we kind of started this with why are you here, Josh? Why are you running for chairs that, oh, well, mm -hmm. nobody else is doing it. I'm not just here because nobody else is doing it. Like, quite frankly, if no one else was doing it, that wouldn't move me at all, Dio. I, I could really care less at the end of the day whether somebody's doing it or not doing it. And quite frankly, part of the reason I say that is because I, I, I would love opposition. I'd love competition. Like, I, I hate the idea right now that this is all just going to get handed to me. That you're just going to, like, throw the keys to the kingdom. Hey, Josh, congratulations. You're chair of the party now. That's horrible, Dio horrible. Nobody should just be handed anything in, in life at all for any reason. Everybody should be made to earn it. There should be no reason I should walk into convention 
in next weekend and you know, hey, this weekend coming up and hey, here you go, chairman of the party, congratulations, kid, you made it to the top of the mountain. Heck no. It, this should be competitive. This People should want to invest. No, I don't think Josh is the best. I think I'm the best. I think I have great ideas. Do you really value yourselves that little guys? Come on. Like, you know, I, I'm really like, I'm putting a message out there to the entire LPS. We have some of the smartest, most intelligent best activists, best candidates, best people for liberty in the entire LP right here in the Sunshine State. That includes you, DL. I want to see people be more ambitious. Being ambitious isn't a sign of weakness. It isn't a sign of, of selfishness. No, it's a sign that confidence, it's a sign of competency. It's a sign that, hey, I, I believe in myself this much and I believe in the cause this much that I'm willing to take this next step of sacrifice and effort to help bring the party into these next things. Because I hear all the time everybody go, oh, well, if I was in charge, I would do this. And if mm -hmm. I was in charge, I would do that. And if it was me instead of Angela, if it was me instead of Nikayla, if it was me instead of Cummings, I would do this, that, and the third, and the party be infinitely better than it is right now. But where are these people, DL? Why aren't they showing up the conventions? Why aren't they running for party positions? Why aren't they running for office if they're that smart, if they're that competent, if they're that capable? And there's a lot of people that are. Why aren't you that ambitious? Do you not believe right. in yourself? That That's my question. I, I want to challenge the OPF. I, I'm nobody special. I, I've done nothing of any significance that, that anybody should look at me and go, I'm an unbeatable opponent. There's there's nothing I do, DL, that is quite frankly special or unique. I'm doing something that anybody else can do. I'm just putting in the time and the effort to do it. That's it. And, and I would hope that, you know, and this is why it comes back to inspiring people. Look at me. If I can do it, anybody can. I'm nobody special. I'm not doing anything. Unique. I tell my staff at work the same thing. I do the same thing on a professional life. I've been, once again, supervising managing staffs for over 12 years now nothing i do is special or unique i'm doing something anybody can do i'm just the one who's willing to put in the little extra effort the little extra dedication go that extra mile anybody could do that they just have to want to do it i want to see more people want to step up i want to see people want it i want to see in 2024 when i'm or 2025 excuse me if I do win chair, when I'm at my next convention running for re-election, I want to see opposition because I love this party so much that I don't want it to be just me, D.L. I don't want it to be just you. I don't want it to be a small circle of people. I don't want this to be a social party. I want this to be somewhere where, it, hey, I believe in this party so much that I believe that we can, I can help take it forward. And I want to be in this position. And if I can inspire one person to go, you know what? Josh is white. I am capable. I am competent. I can do this. Why am I sitting here at home? Why am I acting like this is a, 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 a punishment and not a privilege to be here? Because quite frankly, it's been a privilege to serve the LPF delegates for the last two years as your vice chair. I've gotten to go around the several states representing the LPF and the LP. I got to lead our, our delegation for a short period at our national convention. I got to speak in front of the national delegate you know, it, it, you know, in support of one of our current at-large representatives for the LNC, who is a member of the Florida Libertarian Party. You know, these are all things that, quite frankly, you know, these are things that I would have never done without the members of the LPF giving me this opportunity, D.L. I didn't do this on my own. This came from people who showed up to convention, took the time, sacrificed their money, put the effort in to show up. And they said, hey, we believe in Josh enough that we're going to invest in Josh. And I decided because you guys invested in me, I'm obligated to invest in this party. I want to show up places. I want to help our candidates out. I want to donate money. And you know what? I don't have all the time in the world. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not Uncle Scrooge. I don't have money bags laying around. I don't have millions of dollars in the bank. You know, I, I, I have a family. I have a child. But I love this so much. I love our candidates. I love this party. I love what what this 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 whole philosophy represents. You know, this is 
you know, the kind of quote Dave Smith, this is one of the most beautiful philosophies in, in the history of human existence. You know, it's one of the most beautiful political philosophies, the, the, the concept of love and voluntarism and taking care of your community, not because you have to, but because you believe in your community so much that you see value in investing back into it. Like, it's such a beautiful concept. And anybody who doesn't believe that, like, I, I don't know what you're looking at, but like, it can't be the same thing I'm looking at. So like, this is where I come from here is I I'm here because I love this party. I, I love the Libertarian Party of Florida. I love its membership. There, I I've met so many interesting and beautiful people who have changed my life prof professionally, personally, socially for the better. Like mm -hmm. I, I went from two years ago, just some dumb kid working a mall job to, you know, I I'm working a very successful, you know, I've moved on to a very successful profession where, you know, I have the opportunity to make a really great salary. And, you know, this was motivated by people who just, who invested in me and said, Josh, you're better than what you're doing right now. We see more potential in you, which I'd never seen before. That comes from, once again, investing in your community and just, you know, this is what I want to bring to the Libertarian Party. So, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of my closing here, DL, but I feel like this kind of touches on every single question you ask here. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? What do I want to do? You know, how am I going to motivate people? How, you know, what is all this about? You, we're, you know, DL, I... I I'm no longer a member of the Mises Caucus. A lot of people do know that. Some people don't. But, you know, I, I really loved what the Mises Caucus, when I first came in, was representing, which was that we're the second coming of the Ron Paul revolution. What did the Ron Paul revolution the first time around represent? Well, you saw it in all the logos. It was emphasized in red, highlighted with the little circular oval. It was the word love. That's what this is all about at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. We do this out of love. We do this because we love the philosophy. We love what we're, we're confident for, we're, we're capable of, what the potential of this party could be. You know, I see too much of this negativity out there where we see people who just consistently browbeat the party, its leadership, you know, and it's on both sides, the Mises side, the anti-Mises side, the, the, you know, the, the, the competent, you know, what I call the rational neutral side. It's everybody. They just, it, it's all comes from negativity. That's never who I'm going to be. I, I, I believe in the power of positivity. I believe in bringing pe people together through positivity. We're all competent and capable of doing anything that we want to. It's just a matter of staying focused, believing in ourselves. And you know what? When people tell you no, don't take the first no. Don't let people tell you no. We can all do this. We can all be better. We just have to focus on what is the real meaning of this? love love of the party love of your community love of each other love of your family all of that just comes down to at the end of the day love love thy neighbor love each other take care of each other take care of your community and guess what your neighbors your community each other will take care of you so that's kind of where i want to wrap that up dl is you know why, why what are we all doing here at the end of the day well we're doing it because we love each other and we love this community and we love the philosophy and if you're not here because you're doing this because you love it there's the door don't let it hit you on the rear end on the way out by all means like you can leave you can go form your own party you know i you know good luck in i'm not even going to give them relevance by naming them out but there have been several people who have individuals who've decided <laughs> to form several other uh, organizations out there and God bless and good luck. I, I wish you all the best. And I love that you're doing that. And you believe that much in the cause for liberty that you believe that this is the best option for you. But me personally, I believe in the Libertarian Party. I believe that the Libertarian Party of Florida is the model affiliate of all of the other states out here. That's why I say there's 50 states out there. You're either from Florida or you're from other, one of those other 49 lesser states. And... I truly believe that within the next 10, 15 years, if we come together, we stay focused and we keep that power of positivity, that we are going to be the first gold state on a map in a presidential election. I have no doubts. All right, folks. Well, I think you, uh, I think you covered it all there, Josh. 
kind of took the thunder away from me from saying, you know, for being able to say, all right, so any final words? Um, I, I, I think he gave them to us. But if you have anything else, um, let me know. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and close out the show for people. Um, no, I've just, you know, anybody who hasn't already, friendly reminder, we do have the Libertarian Party of Florida convention coming up April 21st through the 23rd in Kissimmee, Florida at the Wyndham Hotel out there. I right. highly, you know, advise if you have not already, please register for a convention. There is still rooms at the hotel. The LPF's room block is sold out again this year, guys. So once again, if you were a foot dragger, I am super sorry. Mm -hmm. That said, I I was one of them this year, unfortunately, and I did find a room at the convention hotel. So don't hesitate. Try out that convention. Call the hotel, guys. There is still the opportunity. You could stay at that convention hotel. If not, there's plenty of really nice hotels all around there, plenty of places to stay. And I invite everybody to come out. We got a lot of great organizations, a lot of great activities, a lot of great speakers. We're going to have Maj Ture. We're going to have Hannah Cox there. Um, I believe we're going to have Mike Mahari there as well, Spike Cohen mm -hmm. speaking virtually. Um, we're going to have Mike Termott there, who's running for president for the LP. So, you know, or is going to be looking to run for president for the LP if he gets the nomination. Let me rephrase that. We're not there right. yet. 2024, right. ladies and gentlemen, show up in that con. Um, digressing, though. Yeah. Everybody, if you haven't already, please show up to the Florida State Convention out here. Um, if you are looking to go, I'm going to be a little bit of a, you know, prejudice the uh, audience here. Vote for Joshua Lofka for chair. Uh, we have a lot of other great candidates who are running for a lot of other positions. There's a ton of four motions that are going to potentially change the organizational structure of the LPF, as well as many rules committee packet motions that are out here this year. So once again, guys, this is going to be a very important and big year for the LPF. If you are a member and a, dele a potential delegate, show up, register, let's get you out there. Let's, let's see you at the convention. If you see me there, don't hesitate. I'll probably be somewhere around the Mike Tremont table. If you don't find me there, I'll be wandering around with my wife and child. So come over, come say hi, let's talk, ask me questions. I'm an open book for you guys, just like two years ago when I ran for vice chair. Awesome. Well, hang there uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the backstage there for a moment while I go ahead and close out the show, Josh. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Apologize again for all the many distractions. It just happens to come with the territory uh, that I've got going on here as being a Liberty Dad because, you know, if you're a good dad, your children come first. But having said that, I hope you enjoyed it. hope you uh, are inspired to run for a position yourself, and I hope you feel more informed whether or not you want to vote for Josh Lavka. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to be working on that, folks. I'm going to work on that one, folks. That is just not working for me. I don't know what's going on with the uh, the linguistics here for me. But at any rate, um, uh, see you guys next time. And hopefully, if you're coming down to the convention, I will be there. So with that being said, I want you to have a great day. Guard your liberty.